Nico, how are you, buddy? Good. How are you, Tony? Okay, everybody. We're we're going to be without Joe until the very end. Joe's uh, once a month. Joe's like on call for work, so this has been a chaotic morning trying to get this all figured out. But I think we got it. So Joe's just going to pop in in about an hour from now, just so he could help us sign off. It's a technical thing um because it's he hosts the zoom meetings but uh so you're stuck everybody with nico and i nico and me today uh yeah nico it's uh the weekend or the yeah thanksgiving's coming up this what four days thursday right yep it's coming quick man yeah it's been a really bad week um you know those my mom for those of you who uh know about the situation she's in adult daycare monday through friday which really helps uh, all the people that are involved it helps them psychologically and physically and so on well we got the i got the the, the message the other day that the it's closed up again because of the covid and it probably will not um that'll be the end of it for this year. And, and hopefully it'll start up next year unless they lose their funding. And that's really bad because the last time this happened, my mother, my mother ended up in a hospital Her mentally, she couldn't handle not being around her, those people and this and that. And it got really bad, uh, really uh, ugly. So um, this is going to be, you know, very difficult for, her and I, uh, and, and everybody else that was involved. Matter of fact, the nurse was crying. Um, she was so upset about this, the one that, you know, the head nurse of the program. And it's just, and then yesterday, a lady friend of mine had, uh, put both of her dogs to sleep and, you know, Nico, I love dogs. You, you met Cheetos and it's going to be a yeah. year next month. I feel so terrible for her to have to, to bury both of her dogs. Um, yeah, it's just been, uh, yeah, tough times for people, you know, bad, you know, holidays for me of all, like I, I mentioned a few weeks, a couple of weeks ago, or whatever it was, I've lost a lot of people in December. So holidays for me are not, you know, not a happy time, but this is crazy stuff. This is going to be a hard holiday for everybody. Seems- it is, it is. And, you know, uh, I've been following the positivity rates with the COVID and they're, they're astronomical around here. Uh, and people just don't want to wear the masks or cooperate. And it's really not a big deal. I told somebody that, you know, I wear a seatbelt a lot longer than I have to wear a mask. Okay. Um, if I drive somewhere and it takes me 35, 45 minutes, you know, let's say to just get somewhere. And then I got to put a mask on for 10, 15 minutes, then, it, you know, 30, 45 minute drive back. So, you know, an hour to an hour and a half with, with just with a seatbelt on it, we get used to it. Seatbelts are no problem. And seatbelts are to protect us and only us. A mask can protect not only yourself, but others. So it's, it's just, I don't get why everybody's just complaining about it. It's not that big of a deal. So when you go to the stores and stuff by you, people aren't wearing their mask. Some are. Well, I haven't been shopping recently, you know, lately, but I will later today. Yeah. The, a lot of them don't. Um, I, I was in a, um, oh, a, a, I forgot the name of the restaurant. It's like a carry out restaurant thing. And, uh, there was people that just didn't wear a mask. And of course the, the help, whatever you want to call it, the cashiers, whatever you want, 
they're, they, they're afraid to say anything. You know, they don't, they don't need to get shot or get abused because that's happening around the country. So they're just basically not, you know, not, not saying anything. I said something, you know, and you know, the guy gave me a dagger, but then he, you know, he just walked out. Um, he didn't say anything because it, it was, it wasn't going to end. It wouldn't have ended well for him, but you know, it just boggles my mind. You know, there, there was a place there. I don't know if it's still there because of the COVID, but it was a really nice um, Polynesian like nightclub bar or whatever it is really cool, you know, and I used to take people there and one day I go in or I try to get in and they wouldn't let me in because I didn't have a collared shirt like this. That's the rules. That was their rules. Okay. What, you know, you could sit there and say, well, what's the big deal? Well, that's their rule. So I didn't make a scene. Okay. I didn't live far from there. I just drove back home, put on a collared shirt and walked back in. You know, it's nobody's infringing on my rights. It's their, their, just like you or me, when you go to a martial arts gym, though, there may be a sign, no street shoes allowed. You got, or no shoes, period. You know, if you're a jujitsu guy, a lot of schools won't allow any shoes on the mat. It's the way it is. Why don't people have a problem with that? But they have a problem with wearing the mask. This is nuts. Okay, this is not like they're asking us to stand on our head or, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, I, th I think it should be up to the businesses to mandate what they want to mandate. I don't really think the government should be over. Well, the government mandates everything. They're, the government tells us to wear seatbelts. Yeah, I don't okay. agree with that. I mean, well, I I think it's a good idea to wear a seatbelt, but I don't I don't agree with the government telling me. So the government should just stay out of it. So then if I shoot yeah. you in the head, the government shouldn't say, well, that's murder. I don't think the government has the right to come into your car and tell you to wear your seatbelt. I don't think that's what the, the founding fathers had in mind. I think that's <laughs> well, the, communism. Okay, whatever. So then let's just not have any laws is what you're saying. Let's just, it's anarchy then. The government should- No, I think the anything. government should be limited and should not over overstretch into your personal- boundaries okay so then if you get if i get mad at you it's a personal thing then i should have the right to you know blow your brains out is that what you're saying where do you draw the line is what i draw, I'm... <clears throat> I draw the line on personal choices so if the government comes into my house and tells me what i should have in my house i don't believe that's their you know boundary they're, they're over overstretching their boundary i think the police are a good thing, although I've dealt with very bad cops many times. Uh, I think it's retarded to think uh, you should do without the police. Okay, so then if it's a personal matter, then that must mean that you are pro-abortion because that's a woman's choice. It's her body. It's her choice. Well, if you're if you're pro-abortion, I mean, we could turn this into a political talk. If well, it seems it's going that way. If you're pro-abortion, then you should believe in. Um, you could choose whether or not to vaccinate because it's your body. It's your choice, right? Well, you tell me. I mean, there seems to be an upheaval here uh, about the anti-abortionists. They're making their statement. Uh, now, my curiosity is, will these same people be pro or anti-vaccination? Exactly. Because I think many of the pro-abortion people that say it's their body, it's their choice, are for forced and mandated vaccines. Well, so conversely, it's a double standard. Well, it's a double standard the other way, actually. It's the people. Not, not really, abortion. because if you if you believe that a life and killing should be illegal, then I don't think it's a double standard at all. I well, don't think it's, I don't think it's just your body. You, If you murder someone that's pregnant, you get a double homicide. Then so you it's not just be, one body. Then you should be for the death penalty, then. I am. Okay, well, a lot of anti-abortionists are not for, some of them are for the death penalty, which isn't, again, hypocritical. Right. Okay. And I want to see if the anti-abortionists are pro-vaccine or anti-vaccine. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. I'm not taking a stand on anything. No, I agree I'm with you. And I, I think most of them, I think most of them are for mandated vaccines, which is a double standard. You know, that's funny. Maybe there where you are out here. Remember, these people all think this is a hoax, even though a quarter of a million people are dead. Uh, 
and they think now they're, they're coming up with all of this. Uh, there's going to be chips tracking you in the vaccine and this and that. Well, then if let's just say that's all true, then you have no one in the world to blame but President Trump, because he's the one who's claiming he's getting the vaccine going. It's all about him. So anything negative that comes out of this vaccine, if there is anything negative, well, the, the vaccine is, pointed at him. The vaccine is going to be worldwide. It's not going to be just in the U.S. Uh, but the, the people in the U.S. Are, are the ones who are saying there's going to be a chip implanted. OK, I don't believe that, um, but I don't I I don't believe that's going to be in the um, coronavirus vaccine. I don't know. I haven't studied you know, what's in it. Um, but they are, the doctors are saying it has a new technology, a DNA and RNA technology that has never been used before, has never been studied, and they don't really know the effects of it. Um, but as far as the chip, I think that's down the line. I don't think it's going to be in this one. Well, I don't know, but I just know that people are, are saying that, and uh, some people. So we'll have to wait and see. But it's, there's going to be a lot of hypocrisy uh, down the way, one way or the other. So yeah. guys that are down the middle, like me, I, I take, I take things as they come. I'm not going to be hypocritical on it because I'm waiting to see, first of all, if the vaccine is even going to be effective. Okay. It's, it's happening quickly, but like I, I told somebody the other day, every drug that's ever come on the market in America has been approved by the FDA until they found out it shouldn't be approved until there's yeah. a problem and you exactly. see commercial you're right exactly you can watch television you can see commercials all the time for law offices that are saying if, if you've taken such and such a drug you know celebrex or this or that you know you're <laughs> you know class action lawsuits right because things take time right you know to um you know to to develop you know in, in a negative way even so uh we're just going to have to take a wait and see attitude Basically, with the drugs and the vaccines, everybody's a guinea pig until, you know, they see the effects of it. You know, they don't really know. Yeah, right. You you become a guinea pig. Exactly. And, um, you know, the, it's it's up. It, it should be everybody's choice. I agree. I don't know. I haven't heard anything about a mandatory vaccination yet, but I do know that they're claiming that you will have to get vaccinated twice with this. OK, it's, it's not just a single vaccination got to right. go through it twice and uh they're going to dole it out in you know in waves you know starting with uh you know first responders or whatever healthcare workers you know and then elderly and and whatnot um but the vaccine no matter what vaccine it is will not work unless you know the majority of the population gets vaccinated you know so if 30 people in the country would get vaccinated well you know is the covid's not going to go away you know if uh, 330 million get vaccinated, well, now we got a fighting chance. But um, again, it's it's just I'm going to be I, it's it's interesting to me because there's a quagmire with some some people that I know that run businesses that are even though the the law right now is that you got to shut down here in Illinois certain things, bars, restaurants, you know, no indoor service basically, uh, all the casinos you know the, the poker machines are all shut down but there's people who are going to be defiant and stay open and yeah, i'm seeing businesses that aren't listening like just uh two days ago i was driving by the barber shop and there was probably like 20 people in a little tiny little barber shop and uh yeah i don't i don't think i think a lot of people are are being defiant a lot of businesses yeah, they are. They that's what I'm noticing. Not so much with the barbershop, although I did go get my hair cut uh, Friday because I figured, you know, if they're going to shut it down, I don't want to go like last time, three months without a haircut. So I was the only one in there. But, uh, you know, and they had to jack up their prices on the barber on the haircut, too, because, you know, she's like, you know, we we're we're so, you know, and, I, you know, we, we we've lost so much business as a business. I said, I haven't taught since February. Don't don't talk to me about losing business. I don't get unemployment. I don't get help i kind of got i mean she's known me for years this lady since i moved out here but i'm like yeah i don't want to hear it you know um but yeah i i do know people who are uh either own bars or restaurants or manage bars or restaurants and uh they were saying that 
they're going to they're going to stay open now the way it is in illinois you could still sit outside okay you if you have a bar that has outdoor service that's fine or a restaurant you could eat outside but this is illinois you know it's it's getting cold already and it's going to be you know not you're not going to be able to sit outside much longer so um you got to be hardcore <laughs> well <laughs> yeah right i mean i'm not i I'm not going to wait 45 minutes outside to get a pizza, you know, a <laughs> deep dish pizza, stuffed pizza, then, and then another 45 minutes to eat it. No, I don't know. that depends on how good it is. Tony. <laughs> well, I, you know. I would do that for Freddy's pizza. <laughs> man. Well, it's just some of the bar owners, you're not going to have any customers. Okay. Because the bars normally didn't have many customers to begin with. The reason the bars were staying open and able to stay open was because of the poker machines that they have now, yeah. outside of the city of Chicago. You're allowed five machines, up to five machines. And on average, you know, it's everyone I know that owns a bar that has told me they're, they're, they average between five and 7,000 a month. That's their profit. Well, that's good, you know, because that pays, that pays everything. It pays all their bills and, and maybe depending on the size of the building, maybe, uh, you know, extra money for them. And then whatever they make on the bar and if they serve food, that's all, you know, I hate to use the word pure, pure profit, but you get my point. That's all, you know, over and done over the top profit. Right. Right. So, um, but if they just had to rely on the bar part, it, it, it doesn't work. Um, and you know, even like, um, nightclubs, you know, uh, or night, I shouldn't say nightclubs, but nighttime bar, you know, at the night, they may not make, you know, they may not get that much. It's not like it used to be, you know, 20, 30 years ago, bars were really jamming. Now, unless it's a specific nightclub, downtown Chicago or some, you know, some community, um, the majority of mom and pop places are, you know, they struggle. And the poker machines, you know, when they came in, I don't remember how long ago now, but it's been a while, uh, eight, 10 years, I don't remember. Um, it really was a godsend for them. And, you know, they, they've been able to stay open, but um, yeah, th those machines are controlled by the state. So the owners cannot just, you know, turn them on. It oh, doesn't really? work. No, it's, it all comes from the state. It's all through computer, internet connections, Wi-Fi's and the state monitors everything. And then it goes through the, uh, the companies that are bonded through the state, um, the entertainment companies, and everything is um, highly, uh, uh, you know, adjudicated. They watch everything. So, yeah, owners, so those, those machines are just going to be sitting there turned off. Um, so that's going to be a, 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 big, a big drain. So, so these, 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 rest, these bars that are staying open for indoor service, they may be defiant now, but um, they may not stay open longer because, you know, you got to, you got to pay your help and you know, who's going to want to work if they're not making any tips because the oh, bartenders and waitresses, they, they work on tips for the, for the most part, you know, yeah, tough. It's tough, tough times for everybody. Yeah. You know, same with gyms, you know, no yeah. more indoor fitness classes. You got to have reservations. You got to wear a mask even when you're on the machines now and this and that. And um, you know, and like I said, with the stuff that we do wearing a mask, is not, um, you know, it, you can't do it. Okay. You, you really, you know, the way we train, you know, how hard it is when we train, I mean, even without yeah. a mask, you're, you're looking for, you actually are looking for a mask when you train an oxygen mask, you know, cause you can't breathe, <laughs> you know, it's hardcore shit. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, Joe, too bad he's not here, but Joe, you know, he wanted me to talk a little bit about rhythm. Um, and rhythm is one of those intrinsic rhythm is like uh different for everybody you know it's it's not one of those across the board things it's more esoteric and basically rhythm even on your job what you do not not your fighting but your your job job you get into a rhythm of what you're doing a pattern and you just get into the groove and and part of fighting you know or self-defense or whatever anything is <clears throat> you, you have your own rhythm um, rhythm does come into play though, more in like an extended fight, you know, like a professional fight. Um, but you know, rhythm is really something that you, it's a groove that you get yourself into where your timing is right. Everything is just 
you know, going along uh, peachy keen. And from a competitive standpoint, you're, you know, you want to really disrupt, disrupt your opponent's rhythm. You don't want to allow your opponent to get set or get planted. You know, it's, it's difficult to address verbally because there's, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things you have to see, but um, you know, it, in a street fight it, it, or, you know, it, it's mainly just blast the guy, you know, just come at him, boom, 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 solidly, smartly, you know, and uh, you, you, you really want to get the fight over before anybody gets a rhythm going. Yeah. That, that's, that's what I was about to ask you. I was going to say, is there really a rhythm in a street fight? Yeah. You know, it happens so quick. Yeah. Right. I mean, exactly. That's, that was, that's what I was kind of leading up to, you know, you just, <laughs> you know, for me, um, my whole rhythm, and now this is really getting deep. My whole rhythm starts before the street fight. Or, and now I'm not talking about getting mugged or just all of a sudden it hits you. I'm talking about where there's a precipitation, like a big mouth, you know, or a car, car situation, something like that. You know, that's what I'm talking about. Um, I, that's when my rhythm starts. Okay, now this guy's getting cocky with me. So now, boom, I get into a mental thing of, and it happens quickly. I, I assess it and I know exactly what I'm going to do to the guy. Okay. So I, I size him up physically. You know, I, I look at any obvious weaknesses like injuries or just whatever pencil neck, you know, if he's, if he's like that, if his ankles are about the size of my thumb, then I know I'm going to, you know, I'll just probably take him down and snap it. You know, these are things that that's my rhythm. Okay. But you're right. Um, the fight should be blast. It should be all over. You know, it, sh it shouldn't a street fight really shouldn't last that long, you know? And then two, let's just say it's you guys, whoever's watching this isn't, you know, really super skilled. You gotta, there, there may be people, innocent bystanders or whatever that want to just get involved and break it up, you know, or jump on you too. So <clears throat> yeah, you don't, it's very difficult to establish a rhythm in a street fight. I don't want to say don't think about it, but you know, just mentally just know what you got to do. And Bruce Lee talks about in the uh, Tao Ji Kung Do using a broken rhythm. So essentially what I think from that is you don't want your opponent to track your rhythm. You want to keep a rhythm and kind of lull them into a rhythm and then break that rhythm, change it up. Yeah. Yeah. That's, but it, it, and it goes beyond fighting. Like I said, it goes into, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to use music cause that's a different kind of rhythm. Uh, yeah, it goes into other things like shooting pool for me, you get into a rhythm. Okay. You get into a, a groove or we call it being in stroke. Right. And, and your pace at the table, um, you want to kind of like, keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. And then if you get a tough shot, and you got to stop a minute and, and think about it. It, it, it can mess you up. Um, so yeah, rhythm in our human body, we have, we have a rhythm to our body. Okay. Um, and it's just one of those things that, that happens to us. It's, it's an, it's part of nature. Uh, we have an internal clock and, you know, some people are in tune with it. Like I am, you know, I always get up without alarm clock. Okay. I, I, I get up all the time. It's, roughly the same time. So knowing that, you know, being cognizant of the fact that we do have physiologically, you know, a rhythm, um, you know, use it to your, use it to your advantage. But for me, again, to go backwards in a street scenario, street fight, you know, my, my rhythm is, is not necessarily uh, strictly a physical thing. It's because you can't practice for it. You know, like, all right. So like in a wrestling situation, you, you train in a wrestling mat, you kind of know your boundaries boxing, you know, you're in a ring, you know, your boundaries, judo, jujitsu, you're on a mat, to, you, you know, you, you know, your boundaries, you know, in a street fight, every, it could be a different surroundings, you know, things that you never, ever envisioned. So it's kind of hard to, you know, you, so mentally you, you've got to get, you got to get your game going here. And I have a clock in my head and I don't know if it's because of fighting or if it's because of being a drummer, but 
I got a good sense of timing time in my head. So I know when this, you know, I know where I'm at in a street scenario, as far as how much time have I invested in this street scenario. And, and that doesn't even mean fighting it, punching it. It means verbal because the minute you start verbally with each other, that clock's ticking. If there's witnesses around. Okay. Cause now somebody's like alerted and they're thinking, okay, I got to watch these two because this may get out of hand. And the minute it crosses a, a, a threshold that witness, be it a manager, a bartender, a cook, it, it don't matter, or, you know, a, a cashier at a store, they may be ready to jump in, you know, pick up the phone or call the cops or call somebody for help. So, um, you know, you've got to have that. You, 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 you have to kind of have that kind of rhythm of, of knowing how much have I invested in this, uh, this confrontation? Where am I at in this confrontation? And uh, is it time to bail this confrontation? Because, you know, you don't want to get arrested for something that, you know, should have been avoided to begin with. Well, Tony, do you think playing the, well, you play the drums and the accordion, right? Yeah. Do you think that translated over to helping you with the, the martial arts training? Oh, absolutely. I've, I've talked, especially the jazz, you know, being a jazz guy. I mean, I started the drums when I was a kid. So uh, the drums were always, the accordion was when I was done training. Okay. When I was done uh, with my bulk of my fight training is when I picked up the accordion. Okay. That was just later, but the theory of jazz, that's when I started studying jazz theory. The drums helped me with my rhythm in fighting and helped me with my movement. I think, because, you know, being a drummer is very physical um, and it helped me with my coordination. Okay. The hand. Now I don't play anymore. As a matter of fact, when I lost my gym, I lost my drums. I never was able to get them out of there. Um, so I don't have drums anymore, but it helped me with my coordination, my four way independence, as they call it with the, with drummers, the hands one, two, and the feet one, two. So you got four way independence. And I really think that helped me with my, um, with my grappling, you know, um, probably, and it helped me with my, uh, um, striking what my boxing stuff and martial arts because i got a good sense of timing and, th and then i because people throw a lot of people especially if they're not skilled like we're talking like world champions they throw in patterns i'll throw a punch in a pattern and a timing thing they don't even probably realize they're doing it and you can pick that up and and it's really simple to getting if you're a good musician or you or if you have a good sense of timing to know how to disrupt their timing okay so like you hit their arm you know, like when you when when you think they're about to set to throw a punch, you don't even need need to land on them on their face or their body. Hit their arm. You know that'll throw them off. You know when you see they're getting ready to get set to throw, boom, you hit them and it screws with their timing. But yeah, I for me the rhythm, the timing all played a big role. And then as I said later, when I started studying jazz theory of improvisation, especially. That re now that really escalated my fighting because it helped me open up in my brain to be more creative. It it, it tapped into my creativity, and um, and and probably even before I started studying the jazz theory, I just wasn't aware of it because of the drums. Because I would always improvise drum solos. You know, you're making stuff up uh, while you're because I was a big soloist. I wanted to be the next Buddy Rich, so I was I would always improvise. So. I probably should give myself more credit. I probably started um, improvising when I was fighting based on the drums. But when, when I really started studying jazz theory is when it all clicked, you know, and, uh, it, and I started realizing all the similarities, you know, between uh, music and how it, how I could relate it to how I, how I fought and I really think how I could teach people. Yeah, I had a coach that told me before, he used to say, when you're grappling, keep a rhythm in your head of, of a song that's not like a really fast paced song and not not really too slow paced either. Just a nice steady pace and keep that rhythm in your head. And he said if you do that and you do it well, you're gonna keep your heart rate where it should be. So it's not going too high or too low. And uh, I always tried to do that from then on is keep a song in my head when I'm grappling and it, it did seem to help help me not get tired out and 
kind of stay calm and focused. Did you have you ever done that when you're grappling? Like keep a song in your head? Yeah, I always sang to myself, you are so beautiful <laughs> to me. I keep breathing. Uh, you know, no, I don't, I don't, I didn't, I never did a song, but I I'm I'm cognizant of my breath. You know, my breathing um is what's really important. Um, in through the nose, out through the mouth, and you got to watch, you know, you, 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 you can't become a runaway locomotive here because you'll gas yourself out. You know, um, and that's why I tell people, no matter how long you can go in the gym, I mean, let's just say for, you know, for a number, let, let's just say you can go five minutes in a gym Well, you can cut that down to maybe 50 seconds in a street fight because you know your adrenaline is just you're nervous you're you know things get escalated so you 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 have to be prepared to breathe properly joe that's one of his problems he holds his breath a lot okay when he when he when he works out yeah um it's no good you know you got to breathe naturally you know oxygen oxygenate yourself and then you know so don't hold your breath don't hyperventilate because that's what you, the more you hold your breath, the more you're going to play catch up. You're going to start breathing you know, through your mouth and all this. You, you can't do that. You know, you, you it's a downhill spiral at that it, point. And we all have done it. Don't, I mean, you know, you're going to get gassed eventually, no matter what, but that don't become gassed because of your breathing. Okay. At least take that out of the equation. You learn to breathe. You'll do a lot better um, than, than you would think. Um, so yeah, breath control is like really important um and you think about well here here's another music tie-in singers you know you listen to opera stars or just you know really 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 trained well you know real world-class singers they got tremendous breath control or horn players they can do and i've talked about this years ago on, on on facebook or wherever circular breathing or they can blow out and then blow in at the same time. And it's imperceptible. Okay. You cannot. So like when you're blowing a note out, it might go. And then when you're blowing in, it'll go, you know, you, you can't tell the difference. Okay. Because it's, it's a, it's a technique. And I've, I've uh, recommended people to read up and study uh, circular breathing and learn how these guys do it. So it's kind of almost imperceptible. It's just another way of controlling parts of your body. Now that doesn't mean that a, you know, a, a trumpeter is going to be a world-class fighter. Okay. But you're, you're taking techniques that work that, that are, you know, time tested and you can use them to, you know, augment your abilities. Uh, you know, not, not because we, because fighting it, you know, professionally, like well-trained fighting is it, it, there's, they borrow from different things. Okay. They, they borrow from exercise physiology or psychology and, and so on. Um, so broaden your horizons and, you know, take some tips from like music, you know, cause music, uh, has been around a long time and musicians are at a far, far, far higher level than fighters as far as their technical abilities. Okay. It's far more difficult. Their careers last much, much longer, you know, and their practice patterns and their tech technique uh, approach is something that fighters or other athletes in general can copy from and use. Uh, they're very, um, uh, what's the word? Ske you know, they're very schedule oriented. Okay. Like I just started practicing again this week for a couple of days on the accordion, trying to play some jazz. Well, I'm shot. I mean, it's not going to happen. I'm, I'm way shot, but you know, I, I remember all my st structure, you know, of, of how I practiced and, and that's how it should be with, with your, with your fight training. You know, you, you break things down and, get a routine going and that's important um so yeah music you know it, many of you that are listening or watching probably don't know like the life of a concert musician okay like a concert pianist or uh, a member of a symphony orchestra you don't realize 
they're they're special people okay because their technique is extraordinary they they spend hours and hours and hours a day playing and practicing um it, it, you know and it's not for everybody you talk about burnout you can get burned out doing that but they're so structured um and then it's kind of nice to look at what you do how what your practice is and you'll see wow yeah man i don't do anything like that man i'm not that into it so yeah, you could you could really learn a lot from 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 those types of people. Do you listen to orchestra music? I have. Yeah, I used to I used to listen to a lot of it. You know, uh, I'm not big in, into opera, but I'm into classical music. I actually started playing classical accordion. My first teacher was a classical accordionist, and he got me with the fundamentals. I mean, I wouldn't say that I was I wasn't very good at it. You know, my my heart wasn't in it. it was in the jazz. But I like some classical music brings me down, calms me down. You know, none of it makes me excited or happy. It, 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 it mellows me out, which is good. It has its place. And there's a tie-in. You know, all music stemmed from then, you know, from, from the classical venue and jazz and everything, rock, you know, all the harmonies and all the – and if you, if you really studied music, you'll find out that a lot of guys back then, Beethoven or – uh, you know, uh, just, just, uh, Chopin, they, they did different kind of etudes and almost like, you know, extended harmonies, like jazz, you know, jazz chords. And, you know, it's, it's really quite interesting, you know, but for me, my, my best is jazz. I love jazz and I love, you know, I love some rock and roll, I, you know, depending on the kind of rock, you know, I'm not into heavy metal, but I'm into, you know, other kind of rock, you know, real good shit. Yeah, I think the uh, classical music is very interesting to me because it's, it just seems like the the musical patterns are really intricate. You know, they're not just like simple beats and melodies. They're very complex to me when I'm listening to it. And uh, it can have like a like a rhythm that just completely shifts and changes in the middle of a, a song and then and, and like a climax and then it goes up and down. It's I think it's really really interesting to listen to and i enjoy it as well as well as jazz music i think jazz music is awesome yeah me too man well you know chamber music there's so many different varieties of classical music you know um and yeah it's it's just a wonderful you know wonderful thing and uh so i am but you know i'm not a classical snob um i mean if anything i'm probably more of a jazz snob I mean, for sure. I mean, I know a lot, lot, lot more about jazz than I do about classical music. But, you know, they've made liturgical music, you know, Bach wrote stuff for the church. Um, they've done mazurkas and polkas, you know, in classical venues. I mean, it's it's very intricate. But yeah, um, it's you know music is just part of uh, our li everyone's life that you know um, should you know most people I shouldn't say everyone but most people's lives it's been around forever and will probably be around till the end of time um, but I would believe now this is just my belief that the drums was uh, well there was something called I forgot what it was called but back in the Pre not prehistoric, but like ancient Greece. It was like a harp kind of thing. I forgot what it's called. I believe it begins with an L. A lyre. Lyre, that's it. Yeah. That's an old instrument. But I would have to think that a a drum, a, drums or of something would have had to been first. You know, or even even like a bongo. Because you know, it's just like, you know, just yeah, just tapping. If somebody would just tap, you know, that is, you know, that's music okay that, that could be some sort of thing so i i would I, I would have to think that the drums probably um or i mean i don't know if it's not meant necessarily musical instrument but whistling you know or singing you know um who knows you know it'd be, it would have been kind of interesting to see the first time anybody thought about writing something uh, you know, or not necessarily writing, but, you know, creating something music, musical, you know? I, I wonder if we have any record of that. Did you ever see the Bucket Boys in Chicago? No, uh, -uh no. Yeah, they're a group of guys that 
usually in the rough neighborhoods of Chicago and they drum on buckets. And- oh, no, no, that. Yeah, okay. I thought you were talking like a Broadway show or something. No, no. I, yeah, I've seen that. Those guys are awesome. And talking yeah. about innovative, just a bucket, man, with the sounds they can make. Yeah, well, the bucket is – there was people doing that when I was a kid. It, it's hard. You know, it's hard plastic, so you can get some good speed going, you know. Um, yeah, it, it, it's it's really interesting. And then there's – there's in drums, you have what's called rudiments, you know, you, you know the, the flams and paradiddles and triple flams and everything. And um, there's a lot of snare drummers that can do amazing things, okay? They have contests and everything. Uh, for the rudiments and then they do tricks with the sticks and everything um it, it's it's quite impressive and then you start doing your rudiments across the drum set you know and you you can come up with some interesting stuff um but yeah the, you know music is is <clears throat> always going to be a part of my life even though I, you know sometimes i don't get the i don't get the uh, therapeutic value out of it like i used to uh right now this is because of things i'm going through but you know um every now and then man i gotta i gotta listen to the tunes man <laughs> gotta listen to my music have you ever practiced circular breathing not on an instrument but you know i i did it because i don't i don't play a wind instrument uh or a brass instrument but i tried you know i i took a couple voice lessons you know and uh try to learn how to, you know, sing from my diaphragm and all of that. Um, so yeah, I, I did study a little bit of it, a little bit of it, but I don't believe that I I'm qualified to teach circular breathing. I really think that somebody should reach out. I mean, like, let's say you wanted to learn it, you know, reach out to a music studio and just say, Hey, you know, does anybody there know circular breathing? You know, problem is when you go to a music store, you know, they may not know it. I, I don't know. But, you know, a lot of those people that teach out of music stores, they may not be, you know, Berkeley College of Music graduates. I don't know. So you, you'd have to you'd have to look into it and ask. But it's certainly something. Um, something worth looking into, you know, are they actually breathing in and out at the yes. same time? Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, not, a, not they when they when they go from like they're blowing a note out. Ooh. so all right, here i'll just um i'll i'll breathe out and breathe in like a normal person so it would be like okay so there was a little pause but the way they can do it is like oh, so it's like it's it's and you get into a rhythm where and then they can take but they go much longer the, the, these notes go on i mean so so a trumpeter let's say can literally play i've heard them hold a note for like three minutes you know they, wow. they just they have such great breath control i mean they could probably go longer but you know it's not musical i mean you know i i, I so there's a song called um like perpetual motion okay which was actually written for the violin by paganini all great classical players play this the piano accordion you name it uh and and horn players can play it you know and a lot of circular breathing is involved in that tune because it's you know you know and it's but it's faster than that um and it just non-stop okay it just all the way through the whole song and they can play it like like nothing i mean it's just you could probably look it up on YouTube. Just type in YouTube circular breathing trumpet or something. And you'll be, you'll be impressed. Um, there was a guy years ago named Rafael Mendez, who was considered maybe the greatest trumpeter of, of his time, if not of all time. And he was another one that did a lot of circular breathing. Um, it, it's, it's really impressive. If nothing else, even if you don't want to practice it, just seeing the limits of what the human being can do. And then say, wow, if this guy can play the trumpet like that or the piano like that or something, I certainly should be able to become a better fighter. You know, I should be able to increase my training or, or not even just increase it, but get, get more out of it. Okay. Um, Cause I know a lot of guys who, who train hard, but they're not getting any benefit out of it. They're not reaping any rewards. And I'm no, I know, I'm sure you've seen that guys yeah. who've been, been playing or practicing for years you know or training for years and they're really not that good 
Um, I, I think a lot of guys confuse quantity with progress. And I think really it should be more about the quality of your training, not the amount of time you're training. If you're training every day, seven days a week, multiple times a day, and you're burnt out and you're showing up and you're just not really in it, you just don't want to be there. I don't think you're really benefiting as much as like someone like me. I, I don't have much time to train. I really try to value that time when I'm there. I think uh, you don't necessarily have to train more and more and more is not always progress. I mean, more is usually better than less, but I think progress should be defined on the quality of the training. I agree. And that's very well stated, very well put. And I'll be frank, the majority of places that I've seen, it's a circle jerk. Okay. It's a feel good. Oh, you did great. Hey, yeah, let's play. Yeah, let's go. That's bullshit, man. Come on. It's not a way to train. You know, I mean, can you imagine? I don't know. Pick your favorite. Pick your favorite guitarist. I don't care who he is. You know, I, I, I don't care. Eric Clapton or whatever. I just don't see any, you know, this just doesn't happen in that kind of world. Okay. These are guys that woodshed on their own. Most of the time they're, they're isolated and they're practicing their scales and their arpeggios and this and that to a metronome and they're getting, getting it up. So it's faster and faster and smoother and smoother and more intricate, more intricate. And then, then their creativity starts to come in and they study all the different chords and inversions, you know, so many places that I go to, it's, it's not like that. They, they want to brag. They want to act like they're the king shit up third Island. They go on the internet, then they do their thing. And this is where they get their release as opposed to just saying, you know what? I don't need any of that. I want to get in here. I want to work. I mean, I want to get better. I want to be better. Okay. And, and people confuse learning new techniques with being better. That's, that's stupid. That's, that's, and that happens. I'd say at least in 95% of the cases, Show me something new. Show me something new. What, you're not even any good at what you're doing now. So it's, you know, and you know this, you know, and, and, and some of the people that are our friends teach like this. Okay. They've been doing such and such for X amount of time. Well, let me show them something new. Dude, my one, my one, accord, well, Jerry Sigler, the guy that does the introduction here on the, the songs here. Uh, he told me once now he was kind of ex exaggerating, but not really. He says, I could teach you everything you need to know about playing jazz accordion in three days, but it'll take you three years to get the technique to do it. You know, that was his, his point. Now he, it was a slight exaggeration naturally, but it, it, it hit home because yeah, I could show you, you know, I mean, you could watch like my videos, you could watch everything that I have on those videos, you know, watch them straight through, you know, take you three, four days to watch all of it you're not any good. You, you, you got to spend years practicing it. So th that's why I don't recommend people watching YouTube instructional videos because people want to come up with like these new techniques, right? Like something new, something tricky, something nobody's ever seen before. But the point is, it, it's not about that. It's about getting good at the fundamentals and getting good at X amount of techniques that you, you need 10, 20, whatever it is and mastering those, you know, and, and, and not say, and, you know, say, I don't want to know anything new. I'm not, I don't want to learn anything new. I, I want, I want to get this down pat. Okay. I want, I want to get, I want to be mastering this a little better. And too many people just don't do that. And it's frustrating for me as a coach, because I know better because they're not going to get any better. You know, they're, they may ooh and awe somebody, Oh, wow. That was kind of cool, but you can't, you can't pull it off in, in reality. Or if you do, it's like a trick shot at pool. You might make a lucky shot, do it again. Then if you can do that same shot, 10, 20 times in a row, now you got something. All right. Otherwise it's a fluke. So you don't want to become a fluky student. Okay. Or a fluky athlete. You know, you want to have repeatable success at doing something. And that takes discipline. And all of us, myself included, we, we go through times and periods where we don't have the discipline, where we get frustrated and say, ah, you know, sometimes it's okay to walk away if, if you're fatigued mentally or physically. That's one thing. But 
you you have to have the discipline to get right back at it you know um that's the real secret technique that's out there is that discipline of of just taking core movements and and just working at it until you can't work at it anymore until you really got it to a point where it's automatic and you know like i was like that with the top wrist lock i was so good at it i knew at one point i could get anybody in the world in the top wrist lock and my coach is like stop it now okay you got to move on now you you're really really good at this okay um now let's move on and use the same principles everything you did to get to be the best at the top wrist lock. Now let's use it to be the best at this technique or that technique or that technique. Most people never get to be the best at anything. Well, at least I did something, you know, really highly. And then he's like, now apply it to this and to that. And that's how it is. It's just like good music. Same thing. You know, you, you get something down really good. And now you know what it took to get that down. Now you apply those same principles to the next technique. So I wish more people would, would do that. You know, they don't, I mean, a lot of people just don't, they just hurry up, show me something else. No, there's a difference between knowledge and, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, the ability to pull it off, but there's a word for execution. There you go. There is a big difference between knowledge and execution and YouTube and places like that breed let's call it knowledge. Not all of it is accurate knowledge, but it breeds knowledge. It doesn't breed execution. Nobody can give you that execution. Not me, not any coach that ever lived. Only you can do that. You have to practice. You have to put in the time and effort to do it. And then you, you your coach can guide you, but he can't do it for you. So, Execution is what you ultimately are looking for. Now, if you just want to be a coach and there's nothing wrong with that, all of us will eventually, that's all we can do when our bodies don't cooperate anymore. That's where knowledge comes into play. That's when you want to accumulate a lot of knowledge. And I want to just point something out to everybody watching and listening that golfers, the world's best golfers, you know, Phil Mickelson or whatever, Tiger Woods, all that. They still have coaches, tennis players. Their coaches are there at the tennis match. They're, they're there. Okay. Boxers, everybody. And the athletes may be better than their coaches as far as execution. Okay. But their coaches have the knowledge and it's a coach's job to continually, you know, motivate and find ways to improve their, their golfer or their tennis star or whoever it is. So, and that's really important to remember, but you have to have that distinction between real knowledge, not, not faux knowledge. You know, somebody makes a YouTube video. doesn't mean that that what they're showing is actually going to be applicable. Okay. Um, but it, you know, y you have to make that distinction. So I wanted both. I wanted knowledge and I wanted the execution. And, um, I, you know, I was, I was lucky enough to be able to pull it off. You know, now as I'm getting older, you know, naturally I'm, I'm not going to probably execute like I used to, you get old, you slow down or you, you know, whatever, but, um, I could still pull, pull it off if I have to, some people can't. So Tony, how do you, how do you deal with the boredom of, you know, trying to master something? Cause I, I totally agree with you about mastering the fundamentals just mastering one technique at a time but it seems to be for me it could be very boring doing the same thing over and over so how do, is there any way you can kind of make it less boring and change it up and you know so that you could continue going without being burnt out doing the same thing i knew that i wanted to be the best in the world not just good the absolute best and I wanted to be the best in the world at more than one thing, which was a problem. But I knew what it took. I was just, I don't know, I can't tell you how I learned it now, but I knew at a young age that in order to be the best in the world at something, it takes de discipline, dedication, and so on. Um, I just don't remember because I was too little when that happened, but I, it was, it was, you know, 
in my brain that you got to do it over and over. And believe me, just like you mentioned, I didn't like having to do the same stuff. Oh, it, it got monotonous over and over. But then when I noticed that, yeah, you know, I'm not really improving and I really want to improve. Well, then I, I, I was shown the error of my ways. If you continue to do this, you will get better. So what I tried to do is I, I made it a little bit interesting. Okay. Um, let's like in music, I would, instead of just doing my exercises, my, there's a thing called Hannon where you, it's for your fingers. I would play it in like a different kind of rhythm, you know, or I would play it like more like a jazzy kind of rhythm just to stimulate me with my fighting. Um, I visualized a lot, you know, I was able to incorporate different kind of movements. Okay. So I didn't necessarily, uh, let's say, all right, let's say I was going for the top wrist lock instead of just naturally, so naturally drilling it in the circular motion, I would add something more to it. I would like do the top wrist lock, then I'd spin, do a spin drill and do it on the other side. I, I try to be a little bit more creative with what I was doing to just break the monotony. Um, but you, the point is, no matter wh wh what creativity or tricks you do, you, you have to have that doggone burning desire to want to get better. And you have to have a coach that, you know, enforces it. You know, it, it seems like when money's involved, you know, coaches, some of them tend to get afraid that you're going to quit, you know, and so they're not going to teach you really the way that should be done. They're going to pacify you in, in a lot of ways. And, man, you know, I can't do that. You know, um, I, I just tell it like it is. And that's why a lot of people they want to go to someplace else because they can get promoted really quickly. They think they can do their, again, they're circle jerking. They're with all their other buddies training and they think they're, they're so good. And they're really not. Okay. They're it's a mutual admiration society. All right. And yet I don't want that for any of my students. I would never want them to have a false sense of ability or security or whatever, you know, in order to get good and to be world-class, you are going to have to dig deep, discipline yourself and, and know, damn it, there's only one way of getting better. And that is, I have to focus. So if you can't do it, and I don't mean you specifically, Nico, I'm not calling you out on in front of the world, but you, you've got to reach deep. Like I can't do that anymore on the accordion. I don't have it in, in my brain or in my heart to dig deep again. I did it. I did it once. I, I can't do it again. All right. I got other things going on that are taking priority in my life, but for you or anyone else, no matter what the, if it's fighting or if it's being artist or whatever it is, just, you have to force yourself, put music on if you have to, you know, or, or, or do it in a different location, you know, do it where you can get something inspirational, put, um, scented candles or incense if that gets you in the right frame of mind i've done all this okay i've tried every everything every trick in the book you know uh, um record yourself now it's easy to do you know video yourself maybe that'll inspire you or watch somebody watch somebody do something let's say it's a single leg takedown somebody great does it watch it over and over and over and then do it you know and then film yourself and watch yourself and then compare yourself see i could never do that back in the day, because we didn't have those, that kind of uh, accessibility, but now there's so many tools, but yeah, I, I, I know you have a world of talent or ability, you know, you do. And, and it's a shame that, you know, that right now we can't work out, you know, because you were really coming along, you were getting great, you know, you were getting in shape and moving well. And mm, life. I think the, going back to the breathing, the, the workouts you put me through tremendously helped my breathing. I mean, probably more so than any other kind of uh, physical fitness I've ever done it, when it applies to, you know, combat sports. Yeah, that's the thing. It has to apply to what you're doing. Okay. Um, and a lot of exercises are great. People are doing great exercises, but it doesn't correlate. Okay. It, it, it doesn't cross over into like the, like I was talking about the hand in exercises for your fingers. It would be pointless for me to show you those. There's no correlation doesn't it doesn't 
make your grip any better. You know, the, <laughs> it would be stupid for me to show you how to do those things. It, it, great exercises. It'll make your fingers very independent, you know, or the Felipe exercises that are lifting exercises for piano. Uh, it, it doesn't carry over to fighting. And a lot, a lot of exercises that people do really don't benefit the fighting. Matter of fact, it can hamper it, you know, um, but yeah, you took to it like a duck to water, man. You were really making improvements. So what, yeah. what kind of um, weight training do you think has a good carryover? Push, pull. Anything that, you know, pushes and pulls, uh, like a bench that pushes, you know, that helps to push. Rows or lat pull downs, that's pulling in. Curls. I've, I've said it a million times. You've got to have, not you, general, generally speaking, you have to have strong arms. Any kind of strength is when you wrap a guy up, they're not getting out, working your grip uh, and working your core, your core muscles, you know, doing stuff like leg extensions. Okay. That's bodybuilding more or less, or it could be rehabilitation, um, but doing some squats. Now I, I told you, I was born with a problem with my back. So I was not a squatter. I mean, I squatted, but it, it would not a lot because it, it would hurt my back. It would compress me. I could deadlift because the weight is below, below my hips. Uh, but when I put weight across my shoulders, it, it would compress my spine. And, I, and so squatting was not good for me, but you know, squats, you can do squats. Um, but I did free squats. I did mostly squats with no weight. Uh, but trust me, man, push, pull anything, push, pull. So you don't want to do, you know, like shoulder, you know, lifts like this. I mean, that's bodybuilding stuff. Okay. It's not, it's not really going to help you, but, um, overhead presses that gave me my shoulder strength, uh, flat bench, um, a lot, a lot of pushups that that's not weightlifting, but still I have to throw that in there and, um, you know, bent over cur uh, rows, you know, that, that, that'll help pull. So like, if you got a leg, you know, you're doing a single leg, you, you want to have that strength to be able to pull them in or double leg and pull them in and tilt, tilt them and whatever those kind of those kind of exercises and of course you know you want to work your neck so the guy's not you know snapping you down all the time but a lot of that is technique too you need to do a nice drill if somebody's trying to snap you down you should go slow but as he's snapping you down push your hips in so don't even like don't even resist just you know, so let's say this hand belongs to the, your training partner. The minute he does this to you, learn to get your hips underneath you and get your head back up. Okay. Um, so a lot of that is body mechanics and you have to become automatic at that. So that's like a punch, you know, like you're countering a punch, imagine. So instead of hitting them, you're, you're coming in with your hips and you're getting your posture back. Same thing with, when you're on the ground. And you're between somebody's scissors, you know, and you get triangle choked or something. It's because you screwed up. Okay. You had bad posture. You were, you allowed the guy to, you know, get you into that kind of position to begin with, you know, you keep a good posture, you know, uh, it isn't going to happen. So the minute you break your posture and you see that that guy's trying to do that, you got to get your posture back, you know, and then you can, you can, you know, uh, stop, stop his thing from, from happening. Um, Many times it's our, our mistake that got us into it. It's not necessarily his ability, although you got to give the opponent credit for, for capitalizing on your mistake, but it's your mistake um, that, uh, that got you into it to begin with. But yeah, um, just core, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, core, not core muscle groups, you know, just, yeah, just, I can't think of the word right now, but major muscle groups combined, is what you combined muscle groups. Yeah, right. You know, you don't need any finishing work. You know, you don't need to do, you know, I'm not knocking bodybuilders because they those guys are crazy in a good way. I mean, those guys are wow, they do things. I mean, you talk about hard work. Um, but there's a lot of exercises they do that you don't need. And of course, too, you got to work your abdominals. You want to do a whole variety of ab work. And um, you know, and then you just want to you, 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 you want to have the ability. And we talked about this before on a show to absorb pain. You know, you need to have a higher pain tolerance and, uh, and, and you got to learn how to breathe. You know, you, that, that's the main thing. You, you just have to breathe. Um, yeah, you know, you can overtrain and everybody's on a schedule. 
So you have to bet you what's more important. I always looked at fitness conditioning was part of it, but not necessarily for the fight. So I could last in the fight 30 minutes because if I'm fighting for 30 minutes, I suck. Okay. The conditioning for me was to allow me to train longer. Okay. To be able to train for two hours straight without gassing or whatever. That's the point. All right. Um, it, it wasn't so the fight would last for 30 minutes because that's a defeatist attitude, man. If I ever, I don't want to fight the last 30 minutes. I want to take this guy out. Boom. So for me, the fitness was always to enable me to end the fight quicker and to extend my training, but to end the fight quicker, not make me last longer in a fight. If, if that makes any sense. Okay. So it was, it's a very aggressive mindset. And the good news is if you do get extended in the fight, you know, well, you, you, you do have the gas in the tank, but for me, it was always so I can work out longer. Yeah, I think that's counter to most people's thinking process of, is of physical fitness that they're always training to fight longer. But I think, you know, that's a lot more reality based. You train hard so you can train longer and end the fight quicker. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I don't know what other people think, but even in a fight fight, you know, a pro fight, why would you want to go, if you're a boxer, you know, why would you want to go 12 rounds and take that punishment? If you could finish the fight in two minutes or two rounds, hey, you know, that's even better, okay? You don't take the kind of abuse, you know, you're, you're, and you're free to go out and, you know, do whatever. So, yeah, for me, though, like, again, I, want, I keep wanting to reiterate to people because sometimes this gets lost. There was no combat sports for the most part, like what we see today in my day, it was all about learning to live on the streets, survive, 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 survive a street fight. And you do not want an extended street fight more than anything. You want that fight to be over quickly. And the fitness allowed me to put in hours of training so that I didn't gas out in training and started doing techniques sloppy. My techniques were still going to be, you know, uh, picture perfect for an extension extended period of time. And um, I mean, that's just terrific, man. That just, you know, for me, it was just duck soup and, and you know, and the Benny is, of course, you know, you're, you're going to, you're not going to gas out, but um, that's just my, that's always been my take on it. You know, I've said this for, for forever, you know, you want to end this fight quick, you know, quickly, not, not extended, you know, um, when other people years ago were saying, oh, fights, you know, take your time, relax. You got all the time in the world. You don't, you don't. That's the worst advice you could ever give anybody. And it's, you know, in a street fight, especially you don't, you don't have all the time in the world. You know, it's, it's scary what can happen. I think in some ways it was a blessing in disguise that you didn't have YouTube and all of this stuff that's available to us right now, because it seems like everybody has uh, ADD and lack of focus when it comes to training. Oh, absolutely. Well, for me, they had books, but not a lot of books, but yeah. Oh, absolutely. And it, that is very frustrating as, as a coach, especially now, because, you know, people want, Oh, I saw this guy do this, that, 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 that. forget those guys, man. You're, you, you don't, I'm sorry, but they may be the great, great guys and all of this, but you, don't watch that shit. Here's what you need to do. Blah, 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 blah. Do this, do this, do this. And I guarantee you, You'll snuff those guys. You know, um, you've seen me when you were working in Chicago with, you know, with, with Jason and Joe Dankowski. They'll say, oh, I saw this guy do that. It's so terrific. Instantly. I never saw the video before. Instantly, I showed him how to counter it. You you were there for that. Joe yeah. Cardinal was there for that. I just blew the guy out of the water, whoever the internet sensation was, because that internet sensation doesn't have the knowledge or the experience of the whole world. He doesn't know what I know. And, and there's other people out there probably that could counter it too. Um, so don't get so wrapped up in it. Those aren't proven methods that you see on face on a blue YouTube or Facebook or Instagram, you know, um, just trust what I'm teaching you and you will become the best in the world. If you put the effort into it, you know, I, I learned that from my coach. Okay. I trusted that I would be the best there ever was if I listened to him and the same with music, although I failed in the music department, 
but I, it, it wasn't because of my teachers. You know, my teachers were as good as they came and they were phenomenal. I just, I just couldn't do it. I, I just didn't have it. All right. I, I just, whatever, I didn't have it, but the fighting, maybe it's because I started young, but I think more or less playing music was fun. Playing music was enjoyable. Learning to fight was about living was if I didn't learn how to fight, I would, I would die. I would be dead. You can't say that about music. I don't need, you know, knowing how to play a musical instrument as good as anybody in the world is not going to save my life, but learning to fight in the environment that I was in, it was going to save my life. And it did. And it, and it did more than once. So that was my inspiration, Nico. Uh, you talk about, you know, light enough, like they say, light a fire under your butt. Well, that wasn't a fire. That was a blast furnace. Okay. Under my butt, knowing I've got to learn this. I've got to be the best. Otherwise I'm going to be dead. So not everybody's going to have that kind of situation, but that was my inspiration for learning to fight, you know, just to live, not to get, you know, a belt or people applauding me or a, a check for $45,000 or whatever it is that they get paid, you know, a hundred, 200 million, you know, it was to live, <laughs> you know, that $200 million check is going to do me any good. If I walk out tomorrow on the street and, and I get jumped and beaten to death. Yeah, that's pretty powerful motivation right there. You sure? Well, yeah. You know, I've talked about this for years. You know, um, it's, yeah, I get, still, I get worked up about it because, you know, I know there's other kids and there's other elderly people and people just your age that are living in environments that are dangerous to them. Okay. And they can't get out for whatever reason. They're, they're not able to leave that situation. And my heart bleeds for those people. Okay. Cause I lived it. I was there, you know, I'm, I'm a sentimental old soul that wears his heart on his sleeve and it comes back to bite me in the ass all the time, but I'm not going to change. You know, this is the way I am, you know, and yes, I get mad and I get a frustrated and I yell and this and that's the way I am, but I, I care. I do it because I give a damn, you know, and it, and it irks me to see somebody suffer, you know, when they don't have to, or they, they get misguided, you know, somebody's leading them down a garden path. It's all bullshit. Okay. They don't have, they don't, I don't want to get started because I know we're all, you know, you, I know we have to wrap up soon because we're on a tight schedule, but we're waiting on Joe Cardinal to come back and, and lead us out of this. Uh, he, he's back. Oh, is he? Yeah. I can't, I can't see what, without my glasses on, but um, so we're just waiting for him to, maybe you can text him and let him know to come in and, or he's in, but sign us out. And just say, hey, there hey. he is. Hey guys, what's going on? Yeah, I was listening to the last bit. Oh, good, definitely so good stuff going there. I'm, I'm, you're a stalker. Okay. Um, part of my training. Well, Joe, so, I'm going to tell you, your hair. You did you get a haircut? Uh, no, I decided to shower it this week, actually. So we got to quit doing that, okay? Because you know we love it when your hair is like. I mean, don't you just love an ego when it's like that? I mean, I, the fan I think, letters you must get. I think it's cool. Yeah, I do too. See, the kids are into it. Thanks. Thanks for the backup there, Nico. That's what that's definitely appreciated. I'm on but, your side, Joe. I, I love, we all love it. Okay. That's just, that's just it. But anyway, I guess we're going to ramp it up, Giuseppe. Um, so, so we I, need you to yeah, I think we got to talk shop just for a second. I think we have to uh, boot Nico out and he has to give me control. So we have to, everybody has to say goodbye to Nico first. Oh, okay. And then you're going to do the outro. Yep. All right. And, See you later, guys. Well, are you going to come? Oh, you're, you're gone. Okay, so are we going to see you next week then, Nico? You're just taking off, taking off? Uh, Yeah, unless I can come back. Yeah, Sorry, I think you can come back in because I got to tell you something. So, all right. Okay. So, I'll dummy up. I'll let Joe do what he's got to do. And and everybody, in case this is an abrupt ending and we screwed this up, thanks for <laughs> watching. And I'll I'll see everybody uh, next Sunday. I, oh, are we still on, Joe? We, we are still on. And oh, I'm... okay. Then you can do the outro that you're so good at. All right. Well, everybody, we're going we're gonna to say goodbye officially here. So uh, catch you all next week. And have a good Thanksgiving, everybody. Yes. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Yes. Mm -hmm.